so we're going to be chatting about the logical problem of evil and whether it's successful. Um, there are sort of a few different versions of the logical problem of evil that I would find that, that I think are successful. Just one brief preliminary note is that to say that a logical problem of evil is successful is not to, to say that, that it, I think that the premises can be established with absolute certainty. Um, I think that the premises are probabilistic in nature, but I think that we have good reason to expect that if there were a god, there would not be um, the, there would not be instances of evil um, at all. There would not be suffering, um, and that there are particular instances of evil that I think, based on our best reasoning, we can rule out as a you compatible know, with God. Um, give us. Uh, um, so I guess, yeah, maybe we should talk about what the logical problem of evil is first. Um, yeah. Because, uh, I, I mean, I take it <clears throat> what, is, uh, what is supposed to distinguish the logical problem of evil from, um, you know, the, the evidential problem of evil or whatever uh, is that it attempts to show that the theist is actually somehow committed to a contradiction or to something inconsistent. Um, and this is, I mean, this is what Mackey thinks. And, and uh, I, I think this is generally how it's understood. Um, and so uh, if that's right, then I think it has to be that the, uh, the premises are things that either the theist accepts um, propositions about what God would be like if God exists or whatever. Um, or else they have to be things that are analytic truths, uh, logical truths, conceptual truths, something like that. Something that the theist can't deny without being committed to a contradiction. Um, sorry, my cat has just jumped up into my lap. Um, no, no problem. Um, um, uh, so I, I mean, I think generally when people talk about the logical problem of evil, they actually mean something... Um, significantly stronger than what you just said. Well, I, I would, I think that, okay, maybe this is just a terminological dispute, but I, I had thought that if you made, if you made an argument, like if there were a God, there would be no suffering. There is suffering, therefore there's no God, that that would fall under the logical problem of evil. Um, yeah, I, thought, I don't think, I mean, I think, um, no, I don't think so, unless you think that uh, those premises are, you know, analytic truths or, or something like that. Because, I mean, it's it's not just that it's an argument from evil and it's put in deductive form, right? Because um, you could put any, I mean, you could put anything in deductive form, I guess. Um, I, I think what's, what's supposed to be, just, and again, maybe this is to some extent just a terminological question, but uh, I take it that What's supposed to be distinctive about the logical problem is the thought that the, the theist winds up committed to a contradiction. Um. Okay, well, so in terms of just whether there's a straightforward logical contradiction between evil and God, um, I, I don't think that there is, but I think that there are other plausible premises um, that would make evil and God incompatible, and those are not straightforward analytic truths. Um, but so, I mean, one of them is, I think that if we accept utilitarianism, then it's pretty straightforward that if there were God, there would be no unnecessary suffering. God would merely create a hedonic paradise. So then the question is, is utilitarianism true? Um, I think we have good reason to, to think that utilitarianism is true, um, which I can talk about. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, what do you mean by utilitarianism? Well, so the notion that we should maximize the well-being of conscious creatures broadly construed um, so I think that it can, could still be considered utilitarianism if one um, is a preference utilitarian or an objectivist theorist. So whatever, whatever makes people's lives go well, the notion that we should maximize that thing. Um, the particular view of utilitarianism that I would defend um, would be uh, hedonistic utilitarianism. So I think we should maximize the desirable mental states of conscious beings. Um, and I uh. think that if we conclude that that's true, God could just create just an inf uh, an infinite amount, or if there's some problem with infinity, just some unfathomable amount of 
beings experiencing unfathomably good lives. Um, yeah, so maybe we need to make it hedonic utilitarianism or something like that. Well, um, but I think it doesn't. It doesn't seem as obvious on an objective list view. Uh, well, I think it. I think that it would be on objective list theory, given that so. Uh, they, nearly all objective list theorists agree that hedonic pleasure is at least part of the good. They just say sure. that there are other things that contribute to it. But <laughs> if there are, um, you know, if the function of the good is, um, if the good is in some way a function of, hedon of hedonic states, that enough positive hedonic states will be enough to outweigh any other, um, any other purposes. Um, unless and so just if there's any trade-off between like knowledge or deep personal relationships and hedonic value god can bring about so much hedonic value that it produces a more desirable state of affairs than um than than merely the one uh involving lots of other things on the objective list yeah god could always bring about more hedonic value um so, I mean, maybe this gets us into sort of no best world type questions. Um, well, but I think that with no best world type questions, um, that if there is no best world, then there can't be a perfect being. Given that I think that there is a very plausible premise, which is that <clears throat> if you have two, two agents who are otherwise identical, and one of them creates a better world than the other one, um, the one who creates a better world would be a better being than the one who doesn't create a better world. Um, and this seems pretty intuitive. If, if you have two beings who are the same in all respects, but one of them just does desires to do and does better things, it seems like the one who desires to do and does better things um, would be a better being. So um, if that's true, then that would mean that um, that if there's no best world, then there can't be any best being. And this seems sort of intuitive. So uh, it, assuming that there's no best baked good, it seems weird to say that there would be a best possible baker. Um, and if there's, you know, the, the fact that there's no biggest integer means that there can be no no best person at writing out the biggest number that they can, because you can always have someone who writes out a bigger number. Yeah, so uh, I guess I don't agree with with that. Um, I mean, there is some intuitiveness to that in kind of ordinary finite cases. Um, but if if you think about, um, do, you, do you know what ever better wine is? No. Okay. So ever better wine is uh, is wine that lasts forever, and it gets better and better over time, right? So it, it gives you a huge amount of utility if you drink it. Uh, and, but like it, the amount of utility it will give you doubles every day. Okay. So no, and, and you're going to live forever and you have, and you have the bottle of ever better wine forever. So, uh, it, no matter when you drink it, the worst option is never drink it at all. Right. Just keep waiting forever. But no matter when you drink it, oh, you could have been, it would produce so much more utility if you waited another day. Right. Um, now, suppose I, I have been perfect up to this point. Uh, I've always done the best thing morally, rationally, whatever, right? I've been rationally and morally perfect. Uh, and then I get a bottle of ever better wine in the mail. Uh, I don't think that I automatically become imperfect morally or rationally or whatever, just because now I got the bottle of ever better wine, even though it follows that I have to do something suboptimal. So I think um, when... Uh, when doing something suboptimal maybe reflects some defect of will or something like that, uh, then it shows that you're not for the good appropriately or it's some, some way it, it tells something, something bad about your quality of will. In those cases, I think uh, it's, uh, it's plausible to think that me being suboptimal makes me imperfect. But I don't think in a case where you're uh, just faced through no fault of your own or whatever, with a situation where you have an ascending hierarchy of better and better options, so that no matter what you do, it's suboptimal, I don't think that that necessarily renders you imperfect. So I think if God is uh, faced with an ascending hierarchy of better and better options, uh, 
then it's not true that God is, is necessarily automatically rendered imperfect. Um, Brian Carolyn and Philip Swinson actually have a, a paper where they discuss this, and they, uh, they argue that there's sort of a, a plausible version of odd implies can uh, that, that implies that um, you can't be automatically made imperfect uh, just by doing that. But even, even setting aside that argument, I, I, yeah, I think uh, it's true that there are better options available. If, if there's no best world, there will be better options available to God. Uh, no matter what God does. But I don't think that necessarily renders God imperfect. Well, so, uh, I mean, I, I just, that you're ever read or why an intuition? I just wouldn't share that intuition at all. I, I mean, it just seems to me like if you have two, two agents who are identical and one of them waits and one of them has it after a million days and one of them has it after 10 million days, that the one who has it after 10 million days would be better um, than the other one. Um, but it's not it's not because either of us i mean we have to stipulate it's not because either of us cares about the good less it's not because of anything like that it's just because both of us realize we need to pick some huge number of days and, and then drink it because you can't wait forever uh i don't think the fact that he picks some huge number of days that's larger than mine necessarily renders me um imperfect you know well so i think that that um so in terms of how good an agent is, to the extent that an agent has um, can can ha has an infinite number of options that increasingly get better, then I think that um, how good they are would be a function not merely of how much good they can do um, and how whether they have sort of pure aims, um, but it would also be a function of how high they set their sights. And so, I mean, let, let's imagine, just to take the, the easy case, let's imagine that the person with the ever better wine consumed it after one day. Um, yeah. Like, in that case, it seems that that, that, that they would be less good. And given that, the, just to make it more, more of a case where morality is involved, let's say that rather than them consuming it, let's say they were giving it to someone else um, who was going to live forever. So they have it after one day. They give it to them after one day rather than after some large number of days. Like that that seems to pretty clearly be a case where um, because they, even though their their aims are, are perfectly good, they didn't set their sights high enough, so to speak. Um, and I, I think that if, if we just look at the world as it is, it's sort of, it's very much like the, the ever better wine be consumed after like 10 days or something, given that like, uh, it's not like we're living in some like unfathomably great utopia where it's like it, it seems like you know every agent and experience is just unfathomable bliss all of the time um but it's just not as unfathomable bliss as it could be in theory um it, it seems more like like having the number for the ever better wine be six rather than a uh, hundred quadrillion let's say mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, what I think is the agent here has to they have to do good enough. Right. They, they should pick some really big number of days to wait. Uh, but then once they've done that, it's not a problem. You know, they could have picked a bigger number. Um, so is is the, is this world like um, opening the wine? after you, you open the wine after 15 minutes, even <laughs> and you don't even let it get better at all. Um, well, I mean, of course, I think that someday we will live in unfathomable bliss for eternity, right? Because um, I think that there's an afterlife. Uh, and I have no idea how many beings will be there, but there may well be an infinite number of beings in the good afterlife. Um, so the question then becomes, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe if you just look at this universe, this universe is not sufficiently uh, good to satisfy us. Um, but really, the question is something like, uh, look, granting that there's going to there's going to be plenty of hedonic value uh, in, in the long run. Um, could part of making the best world be um, allowing us to, uh, well, I guess either, uh, you know, if there are these objective list type goods that that render other sorts of goods, you know, that might require the existence of suffering or something. Could it be allowing a period where where we pursue some of those? Um, or even, I mean, there's also a question about um, 
you know, if you have to satisfy and you're a pure consequentialist, all you think that what matters is the, the overall outcome at the end, uh, you might think, well, look, so God has to make a world that is above this line. Uh, there will be pl- plenty of worlds above this line. Some of those worlds will have a lot of evil because they just have offsetting goods, right? Um, so it might even follow from the kind of uh, consequentialist satisficing view that there doesn't even need to be any reason for God to allow evil because you just pick a world that's good enough and some of those will have a lot of evil in them. Um, I'm not saying that that view works, but I think uh, if you're generally sympathetic to consequentialism, it's, I mean, there's some, there's some plausibility to that. It does seem perverse, of course, but, you know, you can tell a story about, well, and, you know, ordinary finite cases, it's a lot different than blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I think, so we're getting, we're getting a bunch of analogies with, with wine and, but so, mm-hmm. um, so our, are you familiar with the big number duels that would that there was mm. one that happened at, yeah so for those yeah, you, have to, you have to pick the biggest number that you can right um, yeah um same thing and so i i think that if we if we look at the world um you know given all the all the suffering assuming that the suffering that we think suffering detracts from the overall goodness of the world because we're utilitarians um uh it would it would be sort of analogous to like um you know, writing the number. So, uh, so, so let's say that there were an infinite number of rounds of this game to make it analogous to the afterlife. And in round one, you write the number like seven, and then you subtract four from it. So it's just seven mm-hmm. minus four. Um, like, okay, you know, there, you have to pick a number at some point, maybe like there, maybe you can't pick the, uh, you know, can't pick the biggest possible number because, you know, there is no biggest possible number. But like, so one, it's not clear why you would go out of your uh, get spend the time to like subtract four to just to to, mm. to just do extra things that detract from how good the world is, um, even if there are an infinite number of of future rounds that are coming up, um, and then the the second point would be that like so um, even though maybe we have we can't go on infinitely like just writing the number seven just see um even if there are an infinite number of rounds to go um seems seems like a bad idea um especially if we think that um which which seems pretty plausible that there's probably more suffering than well-being in the world currently if we take into account wild animal suffering so maybe it would be more like three minus four so it's it, it ends up being negative for round one um, yeah so it's important to get, I mean, what I'm claiming, and this is, I mean, this is what I thought anyway. It's not like I came up with this just in response to the Novus world. What I'm claiming is that the world contains infinite net positive utility, right? Um, because of uh, a good afterlife in the end. Maybe there are even other universes where, um, you know, things things are, are sunnier than they are here. I don't know. Uh, but... Um, <clears throat> You know, the, the only, I mean, maybe the most plausible proposal for how there could be a best world is the sort of class crave view on which you you hold to the, um, the, the identity of indiscernibles. And so you say you can't make sort of intrinsic qualitative duplicates. And so at some point, if God makes all of the, all of the unbalanced good universes, uh, then God can't make any more because that would require that you make intrinsic duplicates or sorry, qualitative duplicates. Uh, and you can't do that. They would just be the same thing. Um, and so God just makes all the unbalanced good universes and some of those have a lot of evil and anyway, but um, sorry, what was I saying? Oh yeah. So I'm claiming that the world um, contains uh, the world, meaning the whole, the whole shebang here, right. Contains uh uh, infinite net positive utility, um, maybe contains an infinite number of beings experiencing infinite net positive utility, who knows? Um, so I don't think it's like writing the number seven, right? I think there's an enormous amount of value. Now the question becomes, uh, so why, why, why pick the evil though, right? Uh, in the number duel, you wouldn't write your number and then write like minus something else, right? That seems nuts. Um, and uh, 
I mean, part of the reason that seems nuts is because there's kind of extra effort and time that goes into writing the minus the other thing, you know, and you wonder why did the person do that? Why didn't they just spend that time making the number bigger or whatever? Um, God's not quite in that situation, right? I mean, you can imagine God sort of um, picks, uh, God looks at, you know, all of the, the unfathomably valuable worlds and he, being a good consequentialist, thinks, okay, I, you know, all I care about is the net, net aggregate value of these worlds. Um, and so he just picks one and actualizes it. And whether that has, uh, you know, a hundred trillion, you know, that has like, uh, you know, yeah, let's say a hundred trillion people who have infinite net positive utility in the end, or it has a uh, hundred and one trillion people with infinite net positive utility, but like they have some period of suffering first. Uh, well, the second one is better on balance. So uh, he, he could, you know, you should prefer that he make that one from the utilitarian perspective. Of course, he could have made the world where there are 101 trillion people, uh, and there's no suffering at the beginning. But then again, he also could have made a world with 102 trillion people, plus there's a little period of suffering, you know? Um, so, uh, it, it's not clear. I mean, I grant that all this is counterintuitive, right? I grant that intuitively, uh, in this situation, it seems like you should just not do any evil. Um, or not include any evil. Uh, but what I'm suggesting is if you're a consequentialist who thinks ultimately, look, what matters in terms of evaluating uh, how much reason you have to bring the thing about or whatever is just the net value at the end, uh, you shouldn't have any reason to care whether there's evil in the world as such. All you care about is how that impacts the overall value of the world. Uh, and there will be plenty of worlds, assuming that there are some worlds that are good enough, there will be plenty of worlds that are good enough and also have evil. Uh, and I think our world might very well be one of those because, again, I think uh, our universe is just a little bit of the whole, the whole world, um, including the afterlife and maybe other universes and whatever. Yeah, so... So first to respond to the the point that you said was made by, I think, Class and Cray. Mm -hmm. that, so, um, I mean, one problem with that is that that seems to, that seems to be basically modal realism, but only the good half of worlds. Um, mm -hmm. But then for the reasons that you actually described to me, which convinced me of this, um, then we're in, in a skeptical scenario because the vast majority of, so at, at this moment, there are an, a, a vast number of ways in which induction could cataclysmically fail one second from now um, and a much smaller number of ways in which induction would continue working. And so we would expect um, j just the frequent, um, like just collapse of induction. Um, and so the fact yeah. that induction seems to work pretty well would mean that, and the fact that I think we just have good, good like philosophical reason, you know, we're all phenomenal conservatives here to, to reject. I, I don't know if you're a phenomenal conservative, but um, it's it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Probably roughly correct. Yeah, no, it, it, uh, Nevin Kleiman, Haga, and I actually have a, a paper that we've been meaning to write for a long time where we say exactly what you said. So I don't, th I don't think that class's proposal would work anyway, because um, I don't accept the, the uh, identity of indiscernibles. So uh, I, I do just think that probably there are just, there's just an ascending hierarchy of better and better worlds. So I, I didn't mean to, um, I didn't mean to uh, rely to endorse that view. I was just saying I think that's the only way that it could turn out that there would be uh, a best possible world, and that would yeah actually feel that it contains evil. Yeah. So, um, but on the on the other point, so I think that well, maybe all the worlds have infinite positive utility. I think that there are ways of doing um, comparisons between multiple worlds that have infinite positive utility. Um, and so just, just intuitively, like it, it seems like there should be a way. So consider two possible worlds, possible world one. Um, I, I just have, um, I just, I just exist continually. I'm in a state of hedonic neutrality. Um, and every 100 years I in experience a tiny bit of suffering. So do the world two, I'm just constantly tortured all of the time, um, for an infinite amount of time. Like both of these worlds will have in total an infinite amount of suffering. But it really seems like we should have um, a way to compare those two worlds. So, and I think that there are promising ways of doing it. So um, one of them, Joe Schmidt talked about at one point, which was 
if you have two infinite largely overlapping sets, then you subtract out the two um, uh, the, the the overlapping features of each of the sets, and so um, and now that may be complicated slightly by um, by and, and so the, the way you would do that in the context of the the case that I just gave would be given that we would say that like um, the the dust speck every century um, given that that would we don't care about it intrinsically because we only care about it because of the suffering caused. So we would write down like, okay, this is 0 0.001 units of suffering per century. The other one is a billion units per century. And then we subtract it out. And then we conclude that the difference is whatever the first one minus the second one was per century. Um, and so it seems like we can still, we can still do that. Um, uh, in the case of, um, uh, in, in the case of, of worlds with positive utility, um, as per the, uh, making it so that, that there could be a world better than this one, even if this one will, as time goes to infinity, have in total an infinite amount of value. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that's all fine, actually. So I, I didn't mean to say, look, this world has infinite positive utility. And so therefore, you know, um, infinity minus any finite number is still infinity. So the overall value is not changed by the inclusion of some finite amount of suffering. I didn't mean to say that. Um, what I meant when I said uh, actually to be perfectly compatible with everything you just said. So um, here's what I'm saying. Suppose it's true that what I said before was right and uh, God has to satisfy and it's compatible with God's perfection that he satisfies, right? Um, now imagine some world where there are, let's say, 100 trillion people who experience positive infinite utility. And there's no suffering at all, let's say. Okay. Um, and we think, okay, that world is, is good enough, let's suppose. Uh, now consider another world where there are 101 trillion people, um, but they all experience 100 years of suffering at the beginning, before they get their infinite bliss. Uh, so now we've added uh, however many uh, years, uh, some quadrillion, uh, quadrillion in some years of suffering, but we've added a trillion people with infinite bliss. So that should be an improvement from the utilitarian perspective, right? Um, the world now, given what, given the framework you just laid out a minute ago, that world is better. Uh, and so if we think, look, the, the, world, the first world with no suffering in it, that was good enough for God to make. And what we care about ultimately is just the net amount of value in the world. We should think the second world is good enough to make. In fact, we should prefer that God make it over the first world. Um, and, and so if the first world was good enough for God to make, the second world should be good enough for God to make. It will be true that the period of suffering at the beginning uh, makes the world worse than it would have been if God had just made the 100 and trilli uh, 101 trillion people with net infinite positive utility if he had just cut out the little bit of suffering at the beginning. Um, but as a consequentialist, you don't care about the evil as such. You just care about its net impact. Uh, and of course, it's always true that God could do things to make the world better if there's just an ascending hierarchy of worlds. But uh, I think uh, for reasons I said a minute ago, what God really needs to do is satisfy us. And there will be plenty of worlds above the line uh, that have whatever amount of suffering you like in them. Um, so I, again, sorry. I'm not saying this is, this is the solution. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to uh, grant you as many of your own normative views and things as I can. Um, but. Sure. But, but I think that, um, I mean, th this just seems to get into the, the no best world problem. Um, but it, it doesn't seem like there's any reason to, if God can either create so, so well, it's true that if God can either create world one, which has a billion people with infinite well-being, world two, which has a billion people with, um, or a billion and one people with infinite well-being, but that one person has a bunch of suffering, but then they get infinite well-being later. Um, it's true that the second one will be better than the first, but it seems like a third one where that's the same as the second one, but just minus all the suffering would be better. Um, 
Yeah, it so, would. But, but then, but then a world with uh, 102 trillion people plus some a little bit of suffering at the beginning would be better than that world. And you should prefer that one as a utilitarian because you don't care about suffering as such. No matter what God does in this scenario, we can grant he could have done better, right? Um, and really? I'm, I'm saying that alone does not render you imperfect. Um, and I'm saying once we get past that, suffering as such doesn't doesn't matter from the consequentialist perspective, right? What matters is just the aggregate value. Um, and right. for so any then, world, uh, oh, go on. Or, no, sorry, good. Uh, I forget exactly what I was going to say. Anyway, go on. Well, but then then the question is just whether there being no best world will being um uh, uh sorry you're you're um uh, you broke up for a second i couldn't hear what you said oh sorry yeah so then then the question is just whether the the fact that there's no best world will without there being a best possible being um yeah. and i mean so from from a consequentialist standpoint, it seems like what we would mean by best possible being is if you were deciding between the two beings, you were deciding which of them you would rather exist, which one would you prefer exist? But then it's just kind of trivial from that, that you would prefer that, that if there's no best possible world, that for every being, there could be another being who's qualitatively identical, who would make a better world, there would be no best being. Because from, from the standpoint of an impartial, perfectly moral third party observer, um, they would always there would always be another possible being whose existence they would prefer to gods um uh, there's something that they would rather god do i guess um than what he's well, done. but uh, but there's also a nut but there but if there's something that they would rather they, god do they, they would prefer that he intended that he intended to make the world with 102 trillion people and no suffering or whatever um yeah they, they could prefer that um i guess what i'm saying is uh i mean this is i think richard yetter chapel actually might agree with this when i when i listened to some of the things uh, he said the other day i think um evaluation of agents of like who is the best agent has something to do with evaluating their quality of will with evaluating how much they care about what they're supposed to care about all that sort of stuff um and uh, I, I don't think in a situation where no matter what you do, uh, you could have done better. I don't think that um, doing less than the best you could do uh, evinces any kind of defect of will. Uh, I mean, no, no matter what your will is like, you'll, you'll be in that situation, right? Um, the, the, this is, this is the... The, I mean, the, the, this is sort of relevant to um, to the Kieran and Swinson point, right? Um, it, it, sh it should be, if, if it's, po I mean, it, it should always be possible for there to be something for me to do uh, that's compatible with my being morally perfect, so it seems. Uh, otherwise, it, I mean, it seems like moral perfection should obey some kind of odd implies can principle. So if I'm in a situation where no matter what I do, uh, you say that I'm morally imperfect, um then i i think something has gone wrong right um usually it's maybe it's usually true that it evinces some defect of will if you do less than the best but in a situation where look you care as much about producing value as anybody possibly could you care about exactly what you're supposed to what you're supposed to care about but uh you just you have to arbitrarily select some amount of good to do because there's no there's no maxing it out no matter what you do, you could do better. Uh, I don't think that um, I don't think that 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 shows that you're imperfect. Well, so I mean, this this may just be a clash of intuitions again, but um, but I mean, to me, it seems pretty intuitive that goodness would be something like sort of like being the the best possible competitor at the biggest number of competition. So there's no best possible and it, and it seems like um that that's part of the, the 
that 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 it seems like the same thing could be true about morality. Um, in terms of the point that you made about the point that Richard Yeager Chapel made, well, so you know, to a consequentialist, character judgments are 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 just sort of instrumentally valuable. So, um, so when we say a person is morally good, um, we're not we're not making a consequentialist judgments. Generally, we're making a claim about their character because that's more useful for evaluating expect the expected consequences of what they'll do. So, you know, it, it, even so, Hitler's grandmother, um, no doubt, did something that had horrendous consequences. Um, far worse than that of Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, and in fact, everyone who interacted with Hitler's grandmother, um, you know, caused her to have sex at a slightly different time, which brought about the existence of Hitler. Um, but, but like, you know, a consequentialist would not say that like the mailman to Hitler's grandmother was like morally worse than Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, because, uh, because he didn't know. right. But in terms of just evaluating it pure, so but, but that's because we're when we're in the business of making character judgments. But to the extent that we're in the business of of picking out which agent we would rather create, um, well, you know, if you could have either made it so that that Hitler's grandmother's mailman didn't exist, or that Jeffrey Dahmer didn't exist, you would, as a consequentialist, you would bet rather um, Hitler's grandmother's mailman didn't exist rather than Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, so yeah, sorry. I, I think what the theists should say when they say that God is the perfect being or the greatest possible being or whatever, um, what they should say is that we're talking about God's uh, quality of will among, along with, you know, amount of power, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but what, what we're talking about is God's character. There are no defects in God's character. He doesn't care about the good less than he should, anything like that. Um, because he's been placed in this odd situation where uh, whatever he does is suboptimal. It's true that whatever he does, we could wish that he had done something that was better. And I guess he could wish that he had done something that was better. It's just a paradoxical consequence of this, um, this situation. But uh, I, I don't think that that um, shows that he's imperfect in the sense that the theist should, should care about. Um, well, if the theist is a consequentialist, then I think it would, um, in that it would show that there, that, that, um, God is imperfect in the sense of there is another agent for whom if you were deciding to bring about either the existence of God or that other possible agent, um, you should prefer to bring about the existence of that other possible agent. Um, and so that, that seems like what a consequentialist should, should say. Um, and even if that, that doesn't, that that's not evidence that God is like vicious at all. Um, God's still a, a nice guy. He's very caring about people. Um, uh, it, it, it would still be the case that that that, that judgment is true. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess one thing to say is I don't actually think the the other agent is is genuinely possible. Um, I, I mean, I don't think there's a, another metaphysically possible agent that would be in the same situation, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you certainly, I mean, you can wish that God had done something uh, better, reasonably, or you could, if you want to phrase it in this way, yeah, you can wish that there was some other agent that did the better thing. Um, but, but I if, just, I, if don't you think can... that, I don't think that that is what, what the theist, once we realize that God is in this odd situation, uh, I don't think that that's what the theist should, should be bothered by. But if, if you can wish... God had done something better, it seems weird to say that God's perfect. I don't think so in this situation, because no matter what, I mean, maybe now we're just going in circles. Um, I, but because no matter what God had done, you could have wished that he'd done something better, right? And I don't think that merely being in that situation renders you imperfect in the, in the sense that we should care about. So, may, okay. I mean, may, maybe we should talk about some of the other arguments you have or something. Um, yeah, I we may or have, just just... I guess um, I, I, I guess I would say I would encourage people to read um, the the Carolyn and Swenson paper about this. I I forget what it's called actually, but it came out in Phil Studies, I think. Um, and I think they have a clever argument about this kind of stuff. But go on. Yeah. So I, I guess uh, wait. What was the question? Um, so let's let's imagine that God had 
been such that all that God existed, and then God made it so that he experienced one, you know, one positive experience every century, and then experienced no positive experiences until a century later and experienced one more positive experiences. And this happened continuously for an infinite amount of time. Um, would you call that God perfect? Um, given that they, you know, because it, it seems like to the extent that you're accepting that no matter what God does, as long as the, 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 the overall quality of the world is still infinitely positive, um, uh, that it seems like if you accept that, then not only in situations where God does like um, things that are infinitely good, uh, but just but just doesn't do as many infinitely good things as he could, because God can always do more infinitely good things. Seems like you have to bite the bullet on, or let, let's modify the scenario slightly. So God experiences one one slightly positive mental state every century, um, and then God also just tortures a trillion people for a trillion years. Um, so that overall things are infinitely good, but like it still seems weird from a consequentialist standpoint to call that being um, morally perfect, um, even so, if things will be infinite overall. Right. So um, I, I I didn't say uh, it doesn't matter as long as the world is infinitely good on the whole. Uh, what I said was from a consequentialist standpoint, you should think it doesn't matter um, as long as the world is sufficiently good. Now, it could be that there are some worlds that are infinitely good on balance, but not sufficiently good, like the world where um, God uh, uh, only, you know, only experiences, you know, one slightly good thing every century or something. Maybe that's infinitely good on balance, but not sufficiently good. Um, uh, so, uh, among the infinitely good worlds, I think some of them have to be sufficiently good. And um, some of the thinking of it in purely axiological terms, you know, some of the sufficiently good worlds will have a lot of evil in them. Now, there is a question about what about in, in your torture scenario, God just tortures a trillion people and then annihilates them, let's say. So those people just get hosed. Um, uh, is it okay that some people get hosed? Um, Provide, given that some worlds will be above the line and contain people who get hosed. Um, there, I'm inclined to think no, and I actually think that maybe illustrates some sort of problem with consequentialism. So I have a paper with Rebecca Chan called Moral Indulgences, where we talk about this in the end, um, and people can read that if they want. Um, but uh, I, that, that came out in Oxford Studies and Philosophy of Religion a couple of years ago. Um, so that, that's what I say about that, that special case where there are some people who, there are individuals who have net negative lives for no reason. Uh, I think that, that raises special, special issues. Um, but, uh, I, I don't think that that's what the actual world is like, actually. So, so are you a universe, are you a universalist or? I, I'm pretty sympathetic. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, I, I hope you're right about this whole universe. <laughs> um, you know, definitely better than, definitely better than eternal conscious torment. Um, I mean, I think overall I would prefer an eternal conscious torment world because, because the, the pleasure in heaven is probably enough to outweigh, but wouldn't, wouldn't bode <laughs> well for me. Um, assuming eternal conscious torment is still out in response to people not being, believing in God, but, um, so I guess we can move on to to one of the other arguments, which so one of the arguments that, that was made was the first premise was that God can bring about any metaphysically possible state of affairs. Um, presumably you would accept that. Um, no. Oh, OK. So or, I mean, it, it might depend on what bring about means. But um, we, we I mean, maybe you should lay out the argument and then I'll say what I think. Sure. So God can bring about any metaphysically possible state of affairs. The second premise is that if evil will serve some greater purpose, then a world where the greater purpose is fulfilled is a metaphysically possible state of affairs. Um, therefore, if evil serve a greater purpose, God can bring about a world where the greatest purpose is fulfilled. Um, and he can do this without, without needing uh, suffering. Um, to the extent that it's a metaphysically possible state of affairs, um, even if suffering is one way of bringing it about, it seems like God, God can find other ways of, of bringing it about. 
um, to the extent that he's omnipotent. Um, so like, you know, people in, in terms of, of, uh, of free will, um, it seems like God can bring it, like there's a metaphysically possible state of affairs in which we have free will, but in which there is not suffering. Um, likewise with soul building, um, um, it's not, you know, it's maybe that this is not best classified as a logical problem of evil. Um, but because, you know, it, it, there was nothing logically impossible about there being like, you know, some, some, some weird um, skeptical theist reason that God can't bring it about. Um, but, you know, it seems pretty intuitive that, that, uh, like it seems like this this at least defeats all of the current theodicies. Um. Okay, so uh, I guess um, uh, regarding premise one, God can bring about any metaphysically possible state of affairs. Um, so I, I think we need here something like um, the the Planiga distinction between possible and feasible states of affairs. Do you know this? Um, so. It, it, it may be that some states are, are going. I I like read about it a while back, but I, I didn't remember the yeah. details of the distinction. Yeah. So I, it just as a toy example, um, so consider this state of affairs. Um, there is uh, a random number generator, uh, and the random number generator is is genuinely random. It's genuinely indeterministic. All right. So it you know it. it operates off of some quantum thing or whatever. Uh, and it's going to select a number between one and 1,000. Um, now consider this possible state of affairs. Uh, the random number generator selects a number and it does it in a genuinely random way. Nobody determines that it select one number rather than another. Um, and it selects six. Uh, that state of affairs is possible, I think. Um, it selects six on the first the first go round. Uh, that state of affairs is possible. Um, it may be that God can't bring it about though, because maybe if God selects that, if God creates this random number generator, uh, it might be that it picks a number other than six. Um, and he, could, of course, he could force it to pick six. But then the state of affairs, it picking six without outside interference in a genuinely deterministic way, that wouldn't be the resulting state of affairs, right? So it might be that there are some states of affairs which are possible, but their obtaining depends upon, uh, you know, processes that in some sense are out, the, the, the direct outcome that God can't determine without um, changing what the resulting state of affairs would be. And in those cases, it might be that there are things which are possible, but which God can't bring about. Um, so for Planiga, um, this all winds up being important because of free will, right? So he thinks there are facts about what I will or won't do in certain situations. Uh, so, uh, if I'm if if I get put in the situation where I'm offered the bribe and I have free will, uh, then you know either I'll take the bribe or I won't. Um, both of those are possible, but supposing I will freely take the bribe, then the state of affairs my freely refusing the bribe is not one that God can bring about. So it's, it's possible, but it's not feasible in the relevant sense. Um, so for that reason, I reject premise one. Um, okay. But so which, so like what explanation for evil would, so I, I can see how that might make sense with, um, with like true randomness, but, mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't understand how that um, would work with free will, given that there is a fact of the matter about, well, okay, so for, for one, um, it seems like we could have free will, um, even if we, we were limited in our ability to cause evil. So, no, I do not currently have the ability to create a nuclear bomb, but I still have free will. Um, and so it's not clear why we need the ability to do evil to have to have free will. Um, but it also seems like God could make beings who have free will, but who he knows will choose the good. So they're free to choose to choose the bad, but um, but they 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 will choose the good. And you know, this this already is the case with most decisions. So um, you know, presumably God is pretty confident that I won't just that that I 
um, you know, creating me that I won't just like randomly stab myself in the eye with a pen just for no reason. Um, even though I have the free will to do that, um, because I'm just, just, uh, I am the type of agent who has no interest in, in doing that. Mm. Yeah. So it, it has to be, yeah. I mean, God could give you free will and just put you in a box and then you wouldn't cause any evil because you're just in a box. You can't, you can't get out, right? <laughs> they could strap you down. Um, so yeah, it, it has to be, uh, and people, I think people, when they're defending free will, the odysseys, you know, they, often they're, they're a little more careful about this. I mean, it, it has to be not just free will, but something like the free ability to help or harm other people and make a big difference to the world and how it goes and take responsibility for each other and form relationships freely and blah, 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 blah. Um, so it, it will have to be something that, you know, in, it may be in the, in the presence of countervailing reasons, you know, while facing temptation and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it, it, it will have to be something that entails that we have, um, you know, the, the real ability to affect how things go possibly for the worst. And, um, something that entails i mean you might think that if you're generally a kind of libertarianish person maybe even if you're a generally compatibilist type person you might think you're actually not free to stab yourself in the eye um you have uh executional control i mean you could do it if you decided to do it um but maybe you don't have volitional control given your psychological states you actually just couldn't couldn't do couldn't bring yourself to do that there you that wouldn't be an action you know the only way you could do that would be if you uh, had a seizure or something like that um so maybe at least for us the existence of countervailing motivations is a necessary condition for freedom but even if it's not maybe it's uh you know especially valuable to overcome temptation and do the right thing rather than just having everything be super easy or that sort of thing um so I, I think that's that's what we should say if we go the free will route, and then I, I think that doesn't doesn't um, fall prey to the uh, the uh, you know God could just put us in a box worry. Um, yeah, I think I, I also I, I wanted to say something about premise two as well. Um, so I, I guess premise two you have if evil serves some greater purpose, a world where the greater purpose is fulfilled as a metaphysically possible state of affairs. Therefore, if evil serve a greater purpose, God can bring about a world where the greater purpose is fulfilled. What you mean is can bring it about without the evil, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, this, this, the, the original blog post was kind of hastily written. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just trying to clarify. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that that, I mean, at least that's not logically true. We can have a question about whether there are any good states of affairs that are actually like this. But, um, you know, it, it may be, uh, so like, here's a question. Could could God um, make ex nihilo uh, a US $100 bill appear in my hand? Uh, um, it seems like it. No, God could make a counterfeit $100 bill, bill appear in my hand, right? Because to be a, a genuine U.S. one hundred dollar bill, it has to be made at the mint, right? And it has to be, you know, it's, uh, approved by the government and all sorts of stuff. So God can make something that was a very convincing replica of a one hundred dollar bill appear in my hand. Couldn't make a real U.S. one hundred dollar bill appear in my hand, sadly. Um, uh, it might be that, um, you know, for the sake of some goods, there actually is some more essential connection to an evil or to the possibility of evil um, besides just a, a causal connection that you could do away with. So, I mean, for somebody like Hick who defends the soul building theodicy, um, I mean, for him, it really is important that it's soul building, right? I mean, God could just create us with souls that started out totally good, right? Uh, but he thinks it's actually there's something valuable about this process of struggling and growing and developing and facing adversity and overcoming it and building a soul, you know, taking maybe there's some sort of self-authorship uh, idea or something like that. Uh, and um, God uh, couldn't couldn't get that without the the soul building process that involves some evil or uh, maybe, you know, my relationship with my fiance. 
has been formed over the course of a large number of interactions that took place over time. Um, and some of those involved, you know, us taking care of each other during difficult circumstances or that sort of thing. Um, maybe there's some value in our relationship that derives from that. Now, of course, God could just could just instill all the mental states in us that we that we have currently for each other, right? Um, but maybe it wouldn't quite be the same, you know, that wouldn't be the same sort of relationship. It wouldn't have the same value if we were just made um, as, you know, intrinsic duplicates of our current selves. Um, so, uh, again, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite, um, you know, my, my view is if we're debating the logical problem of evil, then all I need to show is, is that this, this isn't like a, a logical truth or something, right? You could have a further debate about whether any of these value judgments are plausible. Of course, I guess you're not going to accept them because you're a hedonist, but, um, I, they're not obviously nuts or something, I guess. And um, I think these sorts of value judgments are what's involved in a lot of the odysseys. Yeah, well, so um, it, so so in order for us to accept the that claim about um, like the the impossibility of um, uh, or the reason why it's more desirable to have have the soul be actually actually built rather than create the fully developed. Um, uh, I think, so that would get into questions of, I think it's called like atomism versus holism. And so the question of whether when evaluating the goodness of any particular moment of one's life, we should evaluate it while considering the goodness of other particular moments of their life. Um, uh, and I, I, I lead, well, I, I strongly favor the, um, well, I'm forgetting on which view is called which, but the view that, that each moment can be considered independently of the other moments. Um, it seems sort of strange to say that that like um, the the two agents who are um, you know in in what appear to be a, the identical situations, um, the future will be exactly the same. How good their the their quality of life is will depend on. Um, uh, on past moments um, that that are now no longer causally efficacious, um, given that in the in, in the other case, you know, they were filled in by other things that had the, that played the same causal role. Um, yeah, so you'll think that because you're a hedonist, right? So that that yeah. falls out of hedonism. I guess every other theory will deny that. I think. Oh, well, I don't. I'm not a hedonist, so I'm going to deny that. Well, I don't think every other theory would deny that. Um, I mean, I think you could be an objective list theorist and accept that. Um, um, or, yeah. Every other theory will probably deny that, I think. I mean, you know, the objective list theorists who care about relationships or achievements or whatever often are going to think, yeah, the, the history of how this came about matters. Um, or similarly, if you're a desire theorist, you know, assuming that, I mean, you know, okay, there are a million different versions of desire theory, but assuming that you hold this on they're all of, false. <laughs> well, I, I agree with that, actually. Uh, but assuming that you hold this some kind of idealization view, you know, like, uh, if what matters is sort of the desires I would have if I was fully informed and rational and blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, it, it could be that, in fact, it's true. Part of the reason that I love my fiance is because of our history together. An intrinsic duplicate of me who's incorrect about that history, you know, might have uh, des might have desires that he wouldn't have if he knew the truth, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess I, yeah, I, 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 this sort of view does, I mean, yeah, it, it will have to say in general that whatever the good is, um, I mean, unless maybe there are kind of organic unities where the, the evil is actually directly part of the good or whatever. In cases where I'm thinking the process that produced it is what matters, uh, it will have to say, yeah, you can't just look at the end result in isolation and its intrinsic qualities. You have to look at how it was produced, and that might make a difference to how valuable it is. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like it all, all roads lead back to hedonism versus... Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. Um, 
I, I will have to go kind of soon, so maybe mm -hmm. maybe not yeah. enough time to have the full on hedonism versus objective list theory discussion. <laughs> um, uh, or I, I assume you're an objective list theorist, either that or there's some fourth category that I'm not familiar with. In the yeah, either an objective list theorist or maybe some sort of hybrid view. You know, some people think, well, maybe uh there's like it's a, some sort of function of the objective value and your attitude towards it right it, it's it's not just the enjoyment it's also not just the objective value because if you have some great friendship but you're like i don't care about this uh you know maybe that's not good for you maybe you need to you need to enjoy the objectively good thing or something and that's like the most valuable thing so yeah I think either either some sort of objective list theorist or some kind of messy hybrid I, I, th I think that that would still just be objective list theorist theory i mean it, that's, it depends on it depends on how you classify it yeah i mean that's right yet our chapel is you and he calls himself an objective list theorist yeah. um, one question that Emerson Green asks is, what does Dustin think about Leon's argument from teleological evil and or Smith's argument from evil and natural laws? Very roughly the problem of natural systems that are designed to cause suffering. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, so I, I guess I should say, I mean, we've been talking about the logical problem of evil um, and I have a particular conception of what that means or whatever, right? I do think that there are facts about evil that are some evidence against theism. Um, and I think that those maybe are, are some of the best. Again, I don't think they're decisive evidence against theism. I think they are some evidence against theism. Um, and uh, yeah, I think those are some of the best versions of the argument, maybe. I mean, I, I'll say I'm actually sympathetic when I'm not in the kind of odd, uh, no best world, you know, maybe you don't need a reason when I'm not in that sort of mood uh, or assuming that's false and we need some sort of traditional theodicy. Um, I'm actually sympathetic to some of these nutty theodicies on which all natural evil turns out to be moral evil. Um, I had a, a paper about the simulation hypothesis where I talk about the fact that if the simulation hypothesis is true, uh, that all, the, all the natural evils we see are actually moral evil. Or, of course, you know, there, there are views about maybe it's demons or, or the fall or whatever. Um, so I, I kind of think maybe one of those views is true. Um, but uh, and then the evil natural systems actually turn out to be the result of somebody's wrongdoing. But um, if not that, then I, <laughs> I guess we'd have to say something else. I think that's one of the stronger versions of the problem of evil. And I mean, I've, you know, I've written stuff about wild animal suffering and that kind of thing. And, and I think that's, that's, that's probably maybe the worst, the worst version. Um, yeah, I remember I saw your article about the problem of, in, of insect suffering mm -hmm. and you know, I, I was convinced. Uh, <laughs> that, um, um, yeah, I, I have, I have a doc of like a bunch of arguments against like just just, mm. just compiling the the sort of like ca uh, capturing Christianity's hundred fifty arguments for theism. I have like mm. two hundred arguments against theism. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think the, the whole amassing numbers of arguments thing. I no, I mean it's 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 very important. So that look, I mean, it's so, good to amass a lot of arguments, I guess. But yeah, the so that when he matter as such, right? When he <laughs> enters his into a Bayes calculator and I enter mine, yeah. mine wins out. Yeah, because it's more. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so one of them, I the one of them is the the problem of insect suffering based on um, your article. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, no, I mean I, I think I had I, I had a paper that just came out about why we should try to intervene to end wild animal suffering. That's kind of the philosophy of religion paper that just came out in um, religious studies. It's like a theological argument for uh, reducing wild animal suffering. Um, so it, it is something that I, that I think all about, that I worry about. But. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Um, so in terms of the theodicy is that you, the uh, demons simulation hypothesis and the fall, um, which I, I think that the simulation hypothesis is my new favorite theodicy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but so, I mean, you then have this problem of why did God allow, well, why, why did God allow us to like, create the technology to design simulations that have lots of suffering in them? Um, 
I think that that's less of a problem for the simulation hypothesis. But I mean, one problem with the simulation hypothesis one is then you have to defend the simulation hypothesis, um, <laughs> which I think is not too implausible. But um, uh, you know, I I wouldn't give it above like a ten percent credence, and so uh, yeah. it would still be a decent amount of evidence. But uh, in terms of demons, like why make demons able to muck with the natural world such that mm. um, you have like malaria and other diseases which kill a bunch of people? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's it's a good yeah it's a good question. Um, I, I I guess I'll say. Um, we're probably not going to get to the bottom of it here. I may actually co-author a book about this sort of approach in the future if people are interested. Um, but yeah, no, that that's a that's a good um, that's a good question. I mean, why why give us this this amount of responsibility? Is that valuable enough? Um, I have. I have another kind of galaxy brain argument about why it might be valuable enough, but that that would lead us into a whole other thing. Um, I would be, I'd be very curious to hear that if, if you have time, um, though after that, I probably will have to go. Um, okay. Um, it's, I'll send it to you in writing. Okay. I, I, um, I'm probably going to write a paper about this at some point. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, this seems like a, a, a reasonable stopping point. Um, uh, even if, even if you know every extra second would add value, it can't drive. <laughs> yeah. so there is no there is no one best possible uh, length of the destiny from it. Yeah. People debate. I, I, yeah. but, when when I was in graduate school at Notre Dame, I, I used to drive back to Virginia, where I'm from, you know, over breaks or whatever. And one night I was I was driving back and I was getting tired, and you know you see the exit, and then yeah, uh, and I was trying to decide when when should I pull over to sleep. And, um, you know, I would see an exit and then I would think like, well, you know, I've driven so far, like two more miles, isn't going to make any difference. And then I get to the next one and I think, well, I and suddenly I was like, no, I'm, I'm trying to like sororities myself back home tonight. Like that can't work. That's invalid. <laughs> that, 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 that has to be wrong. So I pulled over at the next stop. I got a room. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's people say philosophy doesn't have an important yeah, number of yeah. implications, but yeah. no, I mean, it prevented you from sororities paradoxing your way back then. Yeah, could have yeah, yeah, so. crashed. Um, Casper Hare told me, I'll let you go after this. Casper Hare told me once about, he had been working on this problem about, this similar problem about <clears throat> person shows you a gray suit and they're like $300. And then they show you a blue suit and the blue suit is just the gray suit with dye in it. And they say four hundred dollars, and you say I prefer the gray suit, or sorry, the blue suit, the four hundred dollars suit. And then they say, you know, we have this other suit that is only three hundred ninety nine dollars, and it has ninety nine percent as much dye as the four hundred dollars suit. And so you can't tell the difference. So you can just save a dollar, and you can't tell the difference. And you think, okay. And then they say, well, actually, I have this three hundred ninety eight dollars suit. Uh, and it has 98% as much dye, and you can't tell the difference from the $399 suit. And so, and, and they do this, and then at the end, you're like, wait, I've got the $300 suit. What, how, how did I, you know, I've done this irrational thing. Um, and he said, okay, so what matters is not whether you can tell the difference, whether you can make the pairwise comparison, but the, just the amount of blueness. So you should just stop at the first, the first uh, trade. And he was at the store, and he was trying to buy an auxiliary cable for like a stereo or something. And he had picked out one and the guy at the desk was like, you know, there's this other one that's a little bit cheaper and you can't even tell the difference. And he was like, no, no, I, I, I won't, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> so it's useful sometimes. It is possibly it's useful sometimes. But, All right, yeah. cool. Thanks yeah, so much. Thanks for, um, thanks for watching everyone.